Hello everyone, my name is Jukka Rissanen. I work in the Intel Open Source Technology Center in Espoo, Finland. Our comms team develops communication technologies for Linux and Zephyr OS. This presentation describes a new and native internet protocol stack for Zephyr. Currently, Zephyr has a Contiki micro IP based networking stack. Uh, this new native stack will replace the legacy stack and uh, initially provide the same functionality as the old one. Native stack in this context means that uh, the IP stack is fully integrated to Zephyr. It's using Zephyr coding style and is fully optimized to be used in Zephyr. So, you may wonder why would, it, would we need a native stack. Um, the Contiki based IP stack initially provided suitable feature set for experimenting. But uh, new feature requests were created and the limitations of the legacy stack were realized. And there's a list of some features that are missing in the legacy stack. So there's no possibility to have a dual stack IPv4 and IPv6. Uh, IPv6 is the more important one for IoT use cases as it's using uh, heavily in 15.4 and Bluetooth networks. Use of IPv4 is still important, but um, it's only used in Ethernet and Wi-Fi networks. Also, the legacy stack can support only one network technology at a time. This means that one cannot have uh, Bluetooth and 15.4 uh, networks uh, connected at the same time. Related to this, uh, there cannot be multiple network uh, interfaces at the same time. For example, you cannot have uh, multiple 15.4 radios running at the same time or having like a sleep or Ethernet connectivity at the same time. Legacy stack uses so-called big memory buffers. Uh, each buffer is uh, 1,280 bytes long in order to be able to receive uh, one full IPv6 packet. This is quite suboptimal as typically the network uh, packets in IoT uh, protocols like co-op are very small, way under 100 bytes. As the Zephyr is also a multi-threaded operating system, using micro IP in this environment is a bit cumbersome because uh, micro IP stack is basically a one big loop that uh, running in Zephyr in this way is uh, very suboptimal. Also, as uh, these IoT devices just need to work, uh, testing the functionality is uh, really important. So we need a way to verify that each new commit in the networking code does not cause any regressions. For these purposes, we are creating a unit and component and functionality testing. And these tests need to run after each commit to the source tree. With legacy stack, this is a bit difficult as the code base already exists and it's slightly easier to create these tests for, for a new stack. So why not port some existing stacks to Zephyr? There's a lot of um, third-party stacks available. And uh, initially we used Contiki-based stack when uh, uh, when we're creating IP support for Zephyr. It worked, but it had limitations as seen in the previous slide. The initial port tried to make possible to merge upstream fixes uh, into the stack, but that became later impossible because the changes we needed to make uh, to the code in order to be it being usable in Zephyr was just too much. There's also one big issue if one wishes to use existing third-party stack as a library. It requires use of adaptation layers 
to adapt the library to the host operating system. For example, uh, Fnet and Lightweight IP both provides hooks to enable them to be used in different environments. The extra adaptation layers causes some memory overhead because we need to map the buffering in these uh, libraries to the native buffering, what is available in Zephyr. If we don't have this adaptation layer, meaning that we are deeply integrating this third-party stack into the operating system, like in Zephyr, then usually the code needs to be heavily modified. So instead, we can just create the native stack instead. But this doesn't mean that we could not reuse the code from third-party library. For example, we have a TCP implementation that is based on Fnet. Uh, and uh, it's just that we cannot push back changes back to Fnet or take patches easily from it uh, because the code has been changed so much. What this means in practice that the native stack is now the upstream stack. Having a unified look and feel of the code is also important. It is much easier to read the code and create the patches if the code looks unified throughout the code base. This is very obvious if you have ever looked Contiki based code in the Zephyr legacy IP stack. One big improvement in the native stack will be the automatic utilization of the unit testing. For each commit, we will run several uh, unit tests automatically. It is certainly possible to create unit tests for third party stacks, but uh, this usually requires more work than creating these stat stat uh, tests while developing the stack. So, how do we, so what exactly have we done with the native stack? First of all, we created the IPv6 and, IPv and IPv4 stacks so that they can coexist at the same time. The IP layer, I mean the IPv, IP3 layer uses the common L2 layer that helps to abstract the device driver away. There's a picture in the following slides. This way it's easier to implement network interface support so that we can support multiple technologies at the same time. We took relevant code from existing stacks like TCP from Fnet and uh, Ripple from Contiki. We needed to heavily modify the code in order to support Zephyr natively. We made also the network buffers much smaller in the native stack. The big buffers are gone, although if you really need those, you can still create such buffers if you don't have memory constraints. Now, the smaller buffers are are chained together to create the support for larger amount of data. And with the native stack, we can also now send data larger than 1,280 bytes. And as I already mentioned, we created the functionally testing uh, framework that verify the native stack is working as, uh, as expected. And uh, this is done in order to get the catch the regressions in the code. So the key features in the new native stack are we have a dual IPv6 and IPv4 support. We have effective memory management. We have a possibility to have a minimal copy data path but this is not always possible. For example, the IPv6 header compression requires some memory copy. We also support threat requirements, but the stack does not support threat at the moment. 
compared to the legacy stack, all the configuration can be done via kconfig. And uh, in legacy stack, some config options were uh, required to be changed in a header file. And as I already mentioned, one really important key feature is the utilization of a testing harness. In the right-hand side, there's a high-level picture of the network data path. We have one RX fiber or thread. These are called fibers in, the, in Zephyr. That receives data from the device driver. The device driver is abstracted as a network interface. The RX fiber runs the protocol dispatcher logic. So depending on the data, like um, UDP or TCP, the dispatcher checks if there are any applications listening corresponding destination port. Then it passes the data to the correct application for further processing. Any control traffic like ICMP messages are handled in the core stack. Uh, but it is possible to, pro, uh, to hook into this system and get this uh, directed to the application if really needed. In the TX side, we have one TX thread for each network interface. And applications write their data to the TX54 that is re then read by corresponding TX fiber. The data is then checked very minimally and passed to the device driver for sending. If the packet sending is okay, the device driver will release the network buffer that is, was sent just now. And if the packet sending fails, the upper stack may retry or discard the packet. In the lower levels, we have the L2 abstraction layer, which is very thin. Its purpose is to provide lower level services for various technologies. For example, IPv4 ARP for Ethernet is handled here. It is possible to share L2 code between same type of technology device drivers like uh, if you have multiple Ethernet different interfaces or if you have a sleep and Ethernet at the same time, they both share the same uh, L2 code. The 15.4 stack has been enhanced in the native L2 layer. In legacy stack, the 15.4 support was very simple and not fully spec compliant. In the legacy stack, we are missing, for example, scanning and association and uh, disassociation. The network management API can be used to start a network scan. It can also send events when important things happen in the stack, like when a new IP address is added to the system. Applications can re, uh, listen these events or activate some uh, commands to, uh, to initiate this scanning, for example. As I already mentioned, the automatic testing is one of the key features of the native stack. It's very crucial that we do this properly. We need to verify that any change to the code does not cause any regressions. And creating these tests is not a trivial task, but uh, we need to do it. And while do, building the stack, it's a bit easier than writing them uh, from scratch to the existing uh, stack. The, if you want to see the code, it's there, uh, they are in the tests slash net directory. For conformance testing, 
we are currently investigating Tahi. Uh, that is used for IPv6 testing. If you have any good suggestions for tools that help uh, conformance testing, we would be grateful to hear. Then some lower level detail to the stack. Uh, this is one part that is very important that the stack will perform optimally. Many third party stacks have a similar network buffer management scheme implemented, but it's not really possible to combine them with the Zephyr network buffer implementation. This means that the third-party stacks like Fnet would need to be changed to use the Zephyr network buffers. The network buffers are allocated from pools and uh, only the available memory limits the number of pools you can have. All the individual network buffer elements in one pool must have the same size. It is possible to chain these network pools, uh, network buffers together. The chain can have um, different size elements in it. And uh, this way we can uh, actually receive a larger amount of data than uh, this uh, 1,280 bytes. That is a limiting factor in the legacy stack. Typically, the size of the fragment in the chain should be selected according to the lower level network technology MTU. For example, in 15.4, the buffer size should be 128 bytes in order to avoid any extra memory copy in the L2 driver. This L2 driver prepares the packet to be sent, so it doesn't need to fragment or reassemble the packets in the lower levels. The network buffer can have a user part combined with it. This means that the protocol specific data can be attached to the individual network buffer. For example, we store IPv6 specific data in the user data part in order to speed up the parsing of the network packet. Typically, we do it so that um, the first fragment or the head of the buffer chain contains this user base specific data and all the network data is in the subsequent fragments. And all aspects of the network buffers can be configured via K-config. Some lower level details also continues. If the system is configured optimally, the size of the network buffer is selected so that um, each buffer can have a link layer headers uh, and MTU size data in it. So it's possible to reserve some extra space for link layer, layer headers in each fragment. This is optional, but recommended. So we could, if we allocate these headers uh, beforehand, we don't do, need to copy data in the lower part of the stack when uh, the link layer headers are put in this network data. But in, in, in any way, the network buffer memory is not linear, so, so it must be partitioned properly when applications are sending data. We have an API for doing that, so applications do not really need to know about this. The link layer information is automatically added by corresponding L2 driver when sending to the network. In the receiving side, the same principle applies. The data needs to be read in chunks by the application. 
but we have a helper API for doing that. Currently, the code can be found in the Zephyr OS Git tree under the net branch. And uh, the current plan is to merge, merge it to the 1.7 release. So the plan is that uh, when uh, 1.6 is uh, merge windows opens, we merge this code into the master. Questions? Are there any API changes? Yes, yes. There, there is a. Sorry? Did you talk about the API? No, no. Uh, we have a new API that re resembles the BSD socket API. It's not really identical to it, but it maps to the BSD socket API and provides all, uh, both. Uh, uh, asynchronous and synchronous APIs for the applications. To maintain compatibility with the old applications, are you planning to release a layer? No, no, no any, no extra shim layers for these purposes. So then once you merge the stack, all the, the applications, the next applications will be broken? Uh, we will fix uh, the, all the sample applications will be uh, kind of work with the new stack, but uh, any extra external applications need to be changed. And this, and this goes in, in the beginning of the merge window. There will be like two to three months of time to update the existing applications. For that. So for that benefit of the existing in the beginning of the merge window for 1.7. Yes. Yes, yes, there is, there is. You can add more, let's see. You can add new fragments into this list if needed. And uh, yeah, that's very easy then. It's just a... Uh, uh, in case there are um, several tasks that uh, need to access the same header for processing, is this possible, like to go away and to duplicate? Somehow. Duplicate, what do you mean duplicating? Yeah. So I mean, if, um, let's, let's, let's say you have um, several, several protocols running on the same layer, so several parts of the same protocol running on the same layer, and you need to modify the same headers somehow, or you work like you're multicasting and you need to duplicate packet and, and, and change and create some more modified new headers. Um, do I need to duplicate the full packet? Yeah, I think you need to duplicate the whole packet. Yeah. Well, how does the new stack compare performance-wise to the old one? Um, only ad hoc testing so far, so I don't have any measurements. But uh, it's faster and uh, use smaller, more smaller memory footprint. And one big reason is that we have less fibers, which means that we have less stack in use and also the uh, Conteki, uh, original Conteki uh, code contained a lot of extra stuff that was not really compiled out properly. So now we only have uh, in the code what, re what really is required for the functionality. We have a DHCP4 client already merged, and a DNS client also is uh, available. Well, the Wi-Fi, we don't support Wi-Fi at the moment. 
So, but it's work to be done in the future. We have the management APIs for, for um, yeah, here, yeah. for doing various management things. At the moment, it's uh, it, we just merged it in, so there's not much functionality yet. But we are adding right now uh, scanning support and uh, association to a pan and so on. Yeah, yeah. Well, at the moment, the code is not yet there, but we are adding it. Okay, so scanning, you are using like scan, scan, yeah. Yes. Uh, we are dish. But uh, there's no support for that yet. We've used um, like a PF for compliance testing, commercial tool, but that works well for the front end and the front end. Yeah, there are a lot of tools available, but uh, not many are open sourced. They are commercial tools. Yeah. Uh, is this for testing? Do you are you are you interested in like um, things like unit testing or also like any sort of things like ripple for instance to make sense to 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 perform some testing in your network multi hub and Yeah, like yeah. Of course we need for for these kind of complex uh, scenarios we need a proper testing uh, environment and real hardware and so on. We, uh, we have this uh, in QMO, we are doing functionality testing. So we are te checking that uh, we are sending some packet and is it correct and so on. And this kind of uh, inside one QMO. There's an, uh, an open test that in, uh, in France and more sites in Germany uh, that's uh, open and free to use for everybody. And uh, four or five different platforms uh, in there. Yeah, that's very interesting, yeah. Oh, okay. All right, good. All right, if that's it, thank you.